grateful she did because that move changed my life and the lives of so many others forever. Um, because Erica is a pioneer, not only in her research where she has been a trailblazer in the maker education movement and needless to say, through her work investigating how people learn in and through the arts, uh, but then there's her work as a practicing artist. Maybe you were lucky enough to see Erica in the University Theater's production of Into the Woods, where Erica played the witch, or you're exceptionally lucky and saw Erica in her original creation, produced by Four Seasons Theater, 40 is the new awesome. Uh, Erica goes above and beyond, starting not one, but two arts education organizations, Playmakers Laboratory, formerly known as Barrel of Monkeys in Chicago, and more recently, Whoop and Soccer here in Madison. Uh, Leveraging her role as professor, artist, and activist, Erica established the UW Arts Collaboratory, demonstrating her astonishing commitments to not only advancing education research, but to improving the conditions of the community she lives and works in. Through this work, which brings dance, music, visual arts, writing, and theater programming to public schools across town, she is literally putting the arts back in education. Through her research, artistry, and activism, not to mention her capabilities as a teacher, which are simply unparalleled, Erica is a pioneer of the quadruple threat level. <laughs> she is, I think, the textbook example of the best things coming in small packages. So it is my absolute honor and privilege to introduce you all to my mentor, friend, and quasi-mom, Professor Erica Halverson. <laughs> Thank you all for being here with me today. Uh, this uh, might be the most exciting day of my life, um, uh, other than my we wedding, <laughs> the day my daughter was born. Um, I'm just so thrilled to be able to share these ideas and, and even more thrilled that there are folks to be in public community with me. All right. Let me do. Making sure people can see you. <laughs> the sign is blocking the oh. camera. There we go. All right. Go ahead. Do your Thanks, thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is the middle of March, 2019. Spring break is looming on the horizon. And if you haven't ever been to Madison, Wisconsin, that horizon is gray, cold, and wet. It is hard to find joy when the temperature never gets quite high enough to take off your scarf, except in a public school building where the heat is so intense and dry that the liquid in your water, bo water bottle evaporates before you can drink it. But there is excitement coming from inside the auditorium at Imagination Elementary School. It is Whoop and Soccer Show Day which means every student is filing into the room to watch a group of professional artists from across the city perform stories written by third graders from their school. This is the fourth year that Whoop and Soccer has been at Imagination. So older kids have already had their stories performed in past years, and some of the younger kids have seen past shows or have siblings who have participated in the program. The Whoop and Soccer actors are already on stage, warming up by playing the exact games. Three things, zip zap zap. They played with kids when they were teaching artists in their classrooms. Kids cry out, there's Andy, or hi Janine. And there's even an unexpected hug between a fourth grader and a Whoop and Soccer teaching artist from last year who was just there to watch the performance. Amanda, the director of this show, calls from, for attention from the stage with our signature, whoop it up. <laughs> Nearly the whole room replies, <laughs> they know the show is about to begin. The show represents the culmination of six weeks of artist in residence work in third grade classrooms. Whoop and Soccer has been bringing teaching artists into classrooms in Madison since 2015. Our mission is to get kids, all of the kids, to express themselves creatively and to see their stories, poems, 
arguments and plays adapted and performed by professional artists. When we enter into a residency agreement with a school, we ensure that we can work with the whole grain, regardless of the kid's perceived ability status. As they say in the best Pixar movie of all time, Ratatouille, <laughs> anyone can cook. <laughs> Once a week, a team of teaching artists leads 90 minutes of classroom activities designed to inspire and stretch kids to write, draw, perform, or dictate stories around a theme. In the first week, we introduce our own make-believe world, Whoopin' Soccer City, and we walk through the basic components of a fictional story. After that, we choose a particular inspiration for storytelling, writing stories from pictures, true stories, playwriting, and arguments designed to make a change. Each theme serves as the foundation for the skills and habits of mind we want learners to develop. In the final week, we collect the stories kids write throughout the residency and share them so they can adapt and perform each other's works. Wuben soccer, noun, something extraordinary of its kind. Calling our program Wuben soccer and creating a special place known as Wuben soccer city where the program happens is an intentional choice. It allows us to create a whole world that we can co-occupy during our residency time. Teaching artists, kids, and classroom teachers all become part of Whoopin Soccer City as a way to acknowledge that we are doing something different than we typically do in school, but that all school people are welcome. Principals often visit Whoopin Soccer City. They come to classrooms and adjudicate arguments about whether pets should be allowed in schools, a favorite debate during Make a Change Day. <laughs> they make cameos in performances, usually as themselves, but sometimes dressed up as other characters. These are still school days, but they are Whoopin' Soccer days. Whoopin' Soccer City allows us to create a classroom space where all students can express themselves freely through writing and performance as individuals and as collaborators. Throughout our time, we tell stories in a variety of formats. We play theater games and introduce the day's theme in a whole group. On Playwriting Day, teaching artists solicit suggestions for characters and settings, and then improvise through a short dialogue with actions that pairs of kids can volunteer to reenact for the class. We also do a lot of story writing in small groups. Each classroom has enough teaching artists to keep the teacher-student ratio to around eight to one. This allows us to split the class among the teaching artists and work in small groups to create and then perform stories for the rest of the class. For example, on True Story Day, teaching artists tell the story of something that really happened to them and then help the students in their groups to create a performance of that story for everyone else. There is also a lot of time during the residency for kids to walk, work alone or in pairs to tell their stories. We encourage them to use whatever media of storytelling is most available to them. Writing, drawing, cartooning, talking out loud for another person to transcribe in order to best express themselves. By third grade, we have found that many kids are worried about doing it right. Doing it right seems to include correct spelling and punctuation and the appropriate number of sentences or words. In Whoopin Soccer City, we empower kids to write in whatever way makes sense for them and for their ideas. Our standard line when it comes to these concerns is, we are really good at reading spelling, so don't worry about us. It's not that we don't care about spelling, it's more that we don't want the right form to get in the way of expression, creativity, and joy. Wuben soccer teaching artists then team up with classroom teacher partners to use story writing as a pathway for moving their students toward mastering standard spelling and grammar practices. Wuben soccer kids also write in whatever language is most comfortable for them. 
In Madison, there are a fair number of third graders for whom writing in Spanish is much easier than writing in English. This works for us, since the schools we work in typically have bilingual resource teachers in the classrooms, and we try to have at least one Spanish speaker on our teaching artist team. There are also kids who speak and practice languages at home other than English, and they are eager to try out hybrid language practices. We have seen stories that have components of Mandarin, Arabic, Hmong, or Russian. Most of these stories represent a mix of kids' current expertise in both their home language and academic English. Every residency, usually an entire grade of anywhere between 70 and 95 students, produces hundreds of stories. The Whoop and Soccer team collects the notebooks that we have given kids to write their stories, and we read everything. That's right, we sit around a giant table, always with snacks, and we go through every journal. Every kid gets feedback from two of us in the form of within-story notes and a short letter at the front of their journal remarking on a particular memory from the residency that stood out to that teaching artist. We encourage kids to write everything down and tell them they can fold over the pages that contain stories they don't want anyone to read. Occasionally that happens and we respect their privacy. Though we don't see kids in that final week of work, we pay our teaching artists for their time and we think of this feedback session as a critically important part of our model. The other thing that happens in the final week is that we start to identify which pieces from the residency's oeuvre we want to include in our totally original vaudeville style sketch show that we premiere at that school for the authors, their peers, and the school community. Many of our teaching artists are also performers, musicians, actors, circus artists, MCs, dancers. And every residency culminates with a group of performers creating and sharing an hour-long show comprised entirely of kids' stories. The overall aesthetic for the show is what I refer to as a Charlie Brown Christmas. <laughs> that tree that Charlie Brown buys might look sad, but it's real. And with a little love from the rest of the kids, it comes to life as the beautiful symbol of togetherness that it's meant to be. Just like Charlie Brown and his friends, our performances are simple and evocative, and everything the kids say is taken seriously. The Wuppen Soccer Company performance is where everything comes together. Each 60-minute show highlights about 20 student-authored stories told in short one to four-minute bursts of pure creativity. We aim to include as many student writers in each show as possible, and before each piece, the writers are called out by name in front of the whole audience to recognize their contributions. Any one show is likely to contain Broadway belting, a Drake rap, a performance art piece told with no words, and a young banana who pretends to be sick so her mom doesn't make her go to school. I'm going to show you an example. The Whoop and Soccer classic, I love Harrison Ford, and you can't tell me no.
at Imagination Elementary. We have not yet settled into the routine of knowing who will push whose buttons, who will run off to write under the table as soon as they get the chance, and who will permanently attach themselves to teaching artist Amanda R., who, a student once told me, looked just like Princess Jasmine, only prettier. <laughs> as teaching artists, we meet in a small room off the school library to plan how we're going to spread ourselves across the 70 plus third graders at the school. There are typically three classrooms of kids, and this year, the classroom teachers have put the kids into mixed classroom groups. We've worked with these teachers before, so they know what to expect from us. They have put the kids into a mellow group, a rambunctious group, and a group that is already super enthusiastic about writing and performing. I take the rambunctious group with co-teaching artist Brian, who has just returned from performing in a national tour of a musical to do some directing and teaching in town. I love when I get to be in a room full of third graders whom teachers see as rambunctious. They are often the most enthusiastic about performing but the most challenging to get to work together. And the classroom teachers we are partnering with are simultaneously curious and amused by what we will do to work successfully in the room. Today, our mission is to get the class to embrace the Wuppensacker Five Agreements. These are the foundations of our collective work together, the way we set up what it means to be in community. We set up the agreements under the banner of Wuppensacker City, the place that is created inside each classroom that includes teaching artists, classroom teachers, and of course, all the kids. When we are in Wuppensacker City, we structure all of our interactions around the agreements. Originally, we called these agreements rules, but quickly realized that this framing felt like we were creating a city ordinance rather than coming together to build a new learning community. We present these agreements and then ask every kid in a small group to recite the following. I agree to these agreements that we have agreed upon in agreeing to work together. Then they approach the written agreements posted on the wall and sign their names, which remain visible throughout our time together. Wuben Soccer Agreements. Every idea is a good idea. Support each other's ideas. Respect yourself and others. Keep the peace. Respect the magic sign. If you ever go into any acting or improv class, the first thing you will learn is the importance of saying yes and. This is my top priority for kids working with Wuppen Soccer that they should say yes. Yes to themselves, 
to their own instincts and ideas, to the ideas of others, and to what can come out of taking our collective ideas to create something new and magical and strange. No but chills interaction immediately and makes participants withdraw or become defensive. Yes and, on the other hand, gives us permission to build on each other's ideas, to take what someone is giving and to make a collective new thing. Saying yes and is also the primary move for good teaching. It is the way to create a classroom where kids can share what they know, take risks, and learn new things. Yes and builds on what we know about how people learn, and it is how the arts can show the way for incorporating creativity throughout teaching practice. In Wuppensacker, working with a group of kids to understand yes and gets you a long way towards the agreements. Every idea is a good idea is mostly about not censoring yourself. By third grade, many kids have developed the notion that their own ideas are no good, that they are not creative, or that there is an expected right answer and whatever they will say is not it. We spend a lot of whoop and soccer writing time just getting kids to express their first thought. Support each other's ideas extends yes and to collaborators. It is not easy to accept someone else's brainstorm and bridge it with your own, especially if you are eight and working with a large group of other eight-year-olds. But getting kids to see the joy in ripping off of one another is one of the great victories of creating together over time. Respect yourself and others is a reminder of the first two agreements but bears repeating because knowing how to be a human among other humans is hard. It's hard for adults and it's hard for kids. We make it a goal of collaborative creation to finish out our time with an emphasis on self-respect and respect for each other and what we make. It is week two of the Wuppen Soccer Residency and we are writing stories from pictures. I am gathered on the floor with a group of nine kids, a piece of oversized sticky note paper between us and we are looking at a picture cut out of a magazine. It is drawn in a cubist style and depicts a jazz trio. They are likely playing a standing bass, a piano, and a drum set, but the artistic style obscures exactly what instruments they are playing. We know it is jazz because the figures are wearing berets and sunglasses, and there are musical notes floating around their heads. We also know they are performers because the bottom quarter of the image features cubist versions of the backs of heads sitting in chairs, as if there are an audience watching the three musicians perform. In group stories, especially in early weeks, the teaching artist does the scribing while the kids provide the ideas. With a group of eight or more, it is a good idea to both ask for volunteers and call on individual kids who may be less likely to jump into a group brainstorming process. Asks of individual kids can come in the form of specific questions. Cameron said there were three musicians. What do you want to name them? Or more general asks, how should we end this story? Sometimes, when everyone wants to participate, I go to a round robin style of participation, where each kid gets a chance to share their idea for the story. The only rule of this process is that you cannot reject anyone's idea. Yes, and. You must build on what the person who spoke before you created. Here is what we wrote. Three musicians had been playing jazz for three hours on, a, on their standing bass and two accordions when an audience threw an apple at Jerry Curry and hit him in the head. <laughs> he passed out and hit his head on the stage. The other two, Bob and Giannis, were happy because they secretly wanted him out of the band. <laughs> Jerry was old, selfish, grumpy, ugly, creepy, and a bad musician. <laughs> Bob and Giannis did Fortnite dances on his body. First they clapped, then they booed, then they called the police. After the concert, 
They arrested everybody, except for Jerry. They just left him there. <laughs> the writing flowed pretty well. As you can probably see, I elicited some details, names of the musicians, for example, that likely came from a kid who hadn't yet participated. You can also probably tell that I allowed multiple kids to do some describing. Old, selfish, grumpy, ugly, creepy, and a bad musician is a yes and list if I ever saw one. <laughs> Not incidentally, when we performed this story, the two people playing Bob and Giannis both referred to Jerry as old, selfish, grumpy, ugly, creepy, and a bad musician. Keeping this language intact during performance was essential. You can also see that I was asking for an ending and got several. I'm pretty sure when the police arrested everyone, I asked, but what happened to Jerry? Their reply, they just left him there, is a pretty great answer to that question. <laughs> when we got to the title of the story, we had a bit of a tussle. We had one strong vote for the man who passed out, which led to someone else to say, the man who did not go to jail, with a late surge for the concert that ended early. <laughs> Disagreement bubbled, sides were taken, and then I did what Shakespeare did. I offered two titles with an or between them to indicate that audiences could take from the story what they chose. Twelfth Night, or What You Will, is one of my favorite play titles of all time. I love the idea that we as audience members get to decide what to call the play. Thus was born the man who passed out, who did not go to jail, or the concert that ended 15 minutes early. <laughs> the title itself became part of the experience. When we performed this story for the rest of the class, we made a big deal of the title, enunciating every word and splitting up the line between multiple kids. Asking our grown-up artists to legit legitimately learn to floss dance so they can play Bob and Giannis in a performance of The Man Who Passed Out is one of the great joys of my life. <laughs> there is nothing better than taking a kid's artistic choice seriously, really going for it, and watching their reaction when they see two old people repeatedly floss on stage. <laughs> and in case you thought I was too highbrow in my humor, I asked our best Pratt faller, a retired reading teacher in her 60s, to play Jerry. Her entire role in the sketch was to get hit by an apple, carried in slow motion by one of the performers, fall over, and lay there until the end. When everyone had left the stage, she lifted her head and asked, where did everybody go? The most important component of a whoop and soccer performance is celebration. We aim to celebrate the creativity of our authors by recognizing and honoring their contributions to our collective art making. Every performance begins with a clear statement of the title and the authors of the story. It is beyond joyful to announce a child's name and story, have them recognize that it is their story, and then hear thunderous applause and whoops from their peers and families. Often, that joy is in the form of laughter. We are not above poop jokes. In fact, we love them. We are also not above falling down, walking into things, using the rule of three, or any of the other tropes of comedy that elicit laughs from the young and young at heart. The dumb jokes are the ones that always bring the most joy. In the goat on the tree and the poor farmer, our farmer loses his goat, played by a silly human who makes great noises but otherwise looks totally human, and can't find her. She is right behind him, trapped in a fake tree. But when he looks everywhere except where she is hiding, the kids go nuts. They scream at our hapless farmer, laugh hysterically, and continuously point at Goat Woman until eventually he turns around. That 30 seconds sparks a lot of joy. I use the word joy and not hilarity because joy can also look like celebration. We celebrate individual accomplishments and contributions especially when we know the writer is not often celebrated for their strengths in the classroom. Teaching artists get to know the kids over the course of our six weeks together, and so we often select stories from kids who shine in the whoop and soccer context, but may struggle in other parts of their school life. 
We also celebrate how difficult the world can be and how kids navigate those challenges. For example, we took a series of letters that a class wrote during our Make a Change Week in spring of 2019 and collected them into a single adaptation. Each of the stories was performed as a series of letters read by different WOOP performers, equally celebrated, equally valued.
favorite line from any story ever is, fun is in the needs. <laughs> it reminds us that fun and joy are not just extras that are nice to have if there's time at the end of the day. In fact, fun is a necessary condition for most of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. How can you have your psychological or self-actualization needs met without fun? These are some very wise humans indeed. That gray day in the middle of March 2019 was a whoopensocker of a day for me. I ran into my favorite kid from the rambunctious group as he filed in for the school performance. Let's call him Jack. Jack has indeed been rambunctious, hard to keep still, eager to make jokes, and highly prolific as a storyteller. I was not involved in the making of the school performance, so when I showed up that day, I was thrilled to learn that his story, The Joe, was included in the show. I was even more thrilled to learn that Jack's mom would see the performance. This is possible because we let the classroom teachers know two days in advance whose stories we will be performing so that they can notify caregivers in case they want to come. I watched Jack see his mom, run over and hug her, and then go sit on the floor with his friends. I talk briefly to his mom. She tells me that the school principal has sent a cab to pick her up. She is very proud and happy that she is able to see Jack's story performed.
excitement as a researcher and as a teaching artist. I have decided that I will interview Jack. We have a quick chat that I record on my phone to capture this moment so that I can remember how impactful the performance was for him and his family. Me. Can you tell me what was your favorite thing about working with Wuppensacker? I am fully expecting him to say, seeing my story performed, or having my mom with me when my story was performed. Those of you who are researchers will know that thinking I can anticipate what an interview subject will say in advance is a serious error on my part. If I already know the answer to my question, why am I asking it? Jack does not disappoint. Jack, my favorite part about Wuppensacker is acting out the stories. He replies with confidence. I am caught off guard. Though I am off screen, you can hear the surprise in my voice. Is, is what? Was acting out stories, like being an actor in stories? Yes. He says this as if I am the stupidest person in the world <laughs> for not understanding him the first time. I am not satisfied with this answer, so I keep pressing. And then how did you feel about seeing your story performed on stage? It was funny. It was funny. Was it what you expected, or was it different than what you expected? It was different. They added a little bit on. Did you like what they added? And they took a little bit away. Yeah? Can you say a little bit about what was different and what was the same? In my story, it didn't have the tea and the tables. And the dragon threw a car at Joe first. See, what can we take from this scene? After I scolded myself for thinking I knew Jack better than he knew himself, I felt excited. He took so much from Wuppensacker that seeing his story performed on stage by professional artists in front of his whole school was not even the best part. Also, for Jack, having the chance to get up and do stuff in the classroom held a lot of appeal. Performing made him feel good. In terms of his own story, the level of detail that he was able to provide on what was similar and what was different was pretty amazing. This was a story he had written six weeks prior to the show and not looked at since. But he remembered that in his story, the dragon started by throwing a car, as opposed to our version where the car throwing was the culminating event. Rule of three, take three actions and save the most outrageous for last. And he noticed that we added the dragon having tea with Joe as he tried to tame the dragon. His own story had meaning for him, our adaptation had meaning for him, and he was actively able to articulate the differences between the versions. Luckily, I am not on camera during this exchange. I'm pretty sure I cried. I cried teacher tears for all he took from the telling, adapting, and performing cycle, and for how just six weeks of working in this process showed me what Jack could do. A quick coda on Jack. He came back to school that night for the evening performance of our show. We offer this second performance so that kids can bring their adults back with them, and we can open the performance up to the greater community. While the school show typically has about 300 kids and 30 adults in attendance, the evening shows have about 50 adults and 50 kids. The vibe is different. We print programs so the adults can see the stories for themselves. And the kids who come get to be super duper special. Jack walked in and I went over to say hi. I was very excited to see him back. Hi, I'm Jack's mom said a woman who was not the woman I had met that morning. I shook her hand, told her how much I adored working with Jack, and let them be. Besides, Jack had some other friends at the show, and he wanted to sit up front with them. I was so moved that he felt happy and proud enough to bring all of his moms to the show, and that the educators around him, his classroom teachers and the principal, knew that this kind of experience would impact them all. Now I may be proud.
We will come back to Wuppensalker throughout the book together. And if you ever get lost in the minutia of this learning theory or that design principle, you can always return to our motto of why we focus on the arts in our quest to transform teaching and learning. Fun is in the knees. Thank you. which, as you can probably tell, uses Wuppensacker as the vehicle to describe the kinds of practices that I think ought to transform teaching and learning. Um, in the rest of the book, I talk specifically about how arts practices ought to change at the level of what it means to be a good learner, what it means to be a good teacher, and how we ought to design the kinds of learning environments that we know take advantage of these ideas. So, for example, um, Art making is a representational practice. When we make art, we are engaged in taking an idea and reinterpreting it through the lens of some set of tools, whether that's songwriting, filmmaking, um, visual art production. That mechanism is the same mechanism across all of the disciplines. Math is a representational task. Science making is a representational task. Civics education is a representational task. So many of you who are educators are already engaged in this cycle of representation as a way to do learning and a way to think about what good learning looks like. The arts are the paradigmatic example of what representation can be. In terms of teaching, uh, perhaps the biggest uh, takeaway for me around how the arts can change teaching is around scaffolding risk taking. So through improv, whether that be theatrical improv or musical improv or dance as improv, um, we are engaged in beginning to take risks with others. And the evolution of improv is the evolution of a set of risks. And what I found from my many years of teaching is if people aren't willing to take risks, they can't learn anything because they're not willing to be wrong. They're not willing to hear what others have to bring in. And they're not willing to try new things. And so scaffolding risk taking is a teacher's primary job in the classroom. And I have a lot of arts-based strategies in the book for how educators can structure the scaffolding of risk-taking for groups of learners. So there are, there are many more examples, but those are some, some big ideas about the ways that arts practices can change teaching and learning. Thank you. Other questions? question the question was how many about how many kids that you work with are not super into what you're doing um, it's a really good question I, I think there are many kids who start out reluctant because we are asking people to take risks in ways 
that they're not usually asked to take risks in classroom spaces. So one of the ways that we manage that is we make all choices inclusive. Let me give you an example of that. I'll give you two examples. One is uh, when we have young people who don't want to participate in performances, we have many necessary roles in performance that don't involve actually speaking words or doing gestures. For example, often our stories are scribed and we need someone, quite literally, to hold the paper up so that other people can read off the paper in performance. Being the paper holder is actually a very important role in the performance. So we have roles that might be considered in other situations non-participation roles that are genuinely important to, excuse me, to the way that we do our work. Give you another example, um, which is in the book. Um, I worked with a young person who was very resistant to writing, and I discovered him one day sitting on the floor with his journal, making giant X's on each piece of paper, flipping it over, which I thought was pretty clever actually, because I couldn't go over there and say, You're not writing. Because <laughs> he was. So I went over there and I sat down. I said, can I see that for a second? And I looked at these X's and I put in each box something I care about, something I'm afraid of, something I want to do, something I want to be. And I handed it back and I said, can you fill these in? And he was like, yeah. So he took it back and he wrote, nothing. Nothing, 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 and he handed it back to me. And I said, that's interesting. You're not afraid of anything? I am afraid of tons of things. Can you make a list for me of all the things that you are not afraid of? <laughs> and he was like, uh, yeah. Yanked the book back and wrote an ent a poem, essentially, that said all of the things that he was not afraid of. We performed that story at the school, um, and I think, I believe we also performed it at our Overture Center performance um, in a large public setting. And we didn't make a big deal of it, we didn't say, this is the story from the kid who didn't want to write anything. Um, but we quietly acknowledged that Forms of non-participation and forms of resistance can actually be forms of artistic creation. So that's a bit of a hedge on the question that you asked. Um, but I think it's a way of saying that arts practices allow for people to participate in a range of ways that are typically not allowed in traditional classroom spaces, particularly forms of resistance as methods of participation. So thank you for that. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Dr. Grant. So I would love this book to be the center of conversations for how we ought to change education spaces. And I say education spaces and not just schools, because we all know that there are many, many sites of learning that aren't just school buildings. And we also know that school buildings have very, very many pressures on them that sometimes prevent this vision from being realized. And I'm not giving up on schools, and I would like this to be the center of conversation in school buildings, and I'm eager to get into the room with school leaders who have the opportunity to make some of these changes, but I'd also like to get in the room with folks at institutions like Madison Library, 
folks, you know, at in museums and after school settings. We have a brand new youth arts center here in Madison that is designed to bring young people from across the city into community around the arts. And this book, for me, acts as the catalyst for the conversations around what is possible in all of those spaces. Um, and, and furthermore, I, I would love for as we move toward what I hope is a post-standardized test version of our schooling world, that this book can serve as a possible manual for what it is we look for in good teaching and good learning and good design. <laughs> One more question? Oh, great. Faisal. So, which chapter was the most challenging to convey in words? Oh, well, I suppose we should ask Lyra that since they did some illustrations for the book when I, when I was missing, uh, missing my words. I think the examples that use performance as a mechanism to explain something turn out to be super hard to convey in words. Um, so in some of the earlier chapters, um, I just, this is a good way to sort of tell the story of the role of the arts in, in learning. I had some photographs from performances that I wanted to use as illustrations. And the quality was bad, the book is black and white, the publisher was not so excited about it, and it wasn't communicating what I wanted to communicate. So Lyra Evans, who created this amazing cover, by the way, um, was <laughs> of those photographs that better convey the meaning of what I had wanted to share about the power of performance as transformation than any blurry black and white photographs could have done. So I think for me, the, the capacity to use illustration really allowed me to, to be true to the vision that I'm describing for young people as well. And certainly my hope is that the next book might look more like a graphic novel if, I, if Lyra isn't super famous by then and um, is able to work with me on that because I think that it really sort of demonstrates the power of the visual art as another mechanism for communicating meaning. Yeah, I think we have to say, to say thank you. So there are books outside, um, which I am allowed to... Oh, okay, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. My name is Connor Moran. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Book Festival. I want to thank Erica. Uh, big round of applause for Erica. I also want to thank Andy Stoiber for uh, introducing and doing the technical side of things tonight. And I want to thank all of you for coming. This is uh, the 20th time that Madison has gathered and Wisconsin has gathered for the Wisconsin Book Festival. It is the first time in two years to the day that we have hosted an in-person Wisconsin Book Festival, and so thank you so much for being here. Um, it is my great pleasure. Um, as Erica was saying when I cut her off, uh, <laughs> we do have books for sale out uh, in the Madison Room. A Room One's Own Booksellers is here selling books today, and all of these events are made possible because of the great work that our authors do, but then by the great work that you do in supporting that work. So please, if you have the means, buy a book today, get it signed. Uh, Erica will be out at the tables in the Madison Room. Um, we will return in about half an hour with Megan O'Giblin for God, Human, Animal, Machine. Thanks so much.